Well, good morning, Open Door Bible Church. I pray that you are doing well and that you are continuing to trust in the Lord. And I pray that you've seen him answering your prayers for wisdom, uh, for guidance, for provision. And uh, this morning, uh, I want to take some time to look into God's word to remind us of the comfort that is ours, the abundant comfort, comfort that is ours in Jesus Christ as Christians. This morning, I'm going to be bringing a hopefully briefer message this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you'd like to turn there, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to look at this first opening part of Paul's introduction to the book of 2 Corinthians, verses 3 down through verse 11. I miss you all, and I really wish we could be gathering together again uh, this Sunday, and yet the Lord is good, and God is in control, and as we miss one another, I, I pray, my prayer is that God would be doing a really good work in our hearts in building our love for one another, um, and being absent from one another, I pray that our hearts will truly grow more united and more in love with God and with one another, and looking forward to that day again when we can gather together corporately as Open Door Bible Church. This week has brought some very difficult news for many. Uh, we, our hearts go out especially to the Mahalik family, and please keep George and Anne and Aaron Mahalik in your prayers as they mourn the loss of their son, Paul. A number of us have been impacted, all of us have been impacted to some extent, some more than others with this COVID-19 virus and the precautions that we're uh, being required to take, and I think it's wise to take. Some of us have been laid off from work, or maybe soon. Others of us have seen um, our lifestyles change dramatically in the areas of just getting around transportation or even going to work, having to work from home. A number of us may have friends or relatives or those we know that have been infected with this uh, difficult virus that's going around. We've been hearing over the last couple months now um, uncomforting information. And my hope this morning is to give us some of God's true comforting information that he has for his church. Um, this verse behind me here in the youth room, I think is very appropriate uh, to what we're going through. Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And I think we could maybe even say wherever you reside or wherever you live, wherever you go. And as Open Door Bible Church is scattered throughout the Middletown area and Harrisburg area, God is with us. And we find comfort in that. And our passage this morning, I pray that will just give us some extra reminders of the comfort, the abundant comfort, overwhelming comfort that is ours as Christians, as we are in Jesus Christ. I'm going to start reading in verse 3, read down through verse 11, and then I just want to share a couple of quick thoughts um, about this passage and about what God promises us in the area of comfort, which we all need at difficult times like this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that 
was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that as we look together in your word briefly this morning, that you would be glorified in our hearts, in our minds, in my words, and our application together to all our hearts through your spirit. Father, we thank you for your comfort. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you always keep your word. Your promises are true. So God, I pray that you will use your word this morning to give us comfort as we begin a new week living for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you've read 1st or 2nd Corinthians and you've gone through those letters, you don't have to go far into those letters to know that Paul had a very close relationship with the church in Corinth. Corinth was a major city, a large city in Greece, and it was known for its export, known for its commerce, and it was also known, though, for its sinful lifestyle. And in the first letter to the Corinthians that we have in the New Testament, Paul writes with great uh, exhortation, uh, even great uh, sadness in his heart to the Corinthians who had gotten their focus off of what it really meant to live as a Christian. And he gave them some very strong words as an apostle, as a brother in Christ, as one who had helped plant this church and had helped get it organized and help them grow into small groups of local churches around Corinth. And as he heard of them not loving God and loving others as God called them to, not living for the glory of God, he wrote them a very strong letter in 1 Corinthians telling them they need to stop. They need to stop living for themselves. They need to stop living unloving towards others. They need to stop living sinfully. They need to live for the glory of God. If you remember 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Paul told the Corinthians, they must do all to the glory of God. And as he writes the second letter, the first letter had been received, and there actually probably had been some correspondence between Paul that we don't have recorded between these two letters. But as he writes 2 Corinthians, there's a different tone, a different uh, tone right at the beginning of this letter, and it's one of encouragement, one of comfort. Paul was writing to give comfort to those who had felt great sorrow as they had been made aware of their sin. And as these people had repented, and as they were still sorrowful over their, their sin, Paul's writing to comfort them that God forgives, and that God wants them to be restored to this local body of church. Some had been um, sent away from the church because they had refused to repent, but one of them had repented and had come back. And Paul encouraged the church to welcome him back because his heart is right. But Paul also write, was writing to, to comfort this church over some of the news that they had heard about Paul and that Paul had been suffering. And we don't know all the details exactly of what he went through, but he lists a couple here. And one of those situations was so dire. They were confident, Paul's ministry team was confident that they were about to die. We don't know if it was a sickness, if it was a persecution from those who didn't believe in the gospel of Christ. But you see that, that Paul had a ministry team. And if you look in verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. And so Paul and Timothy, as well as his ministry team, is writing this letter to encourage the Corinthians, to encourage those who, who still need to, to repent of sin, to do that, but to encourage those who had repented, who were living for God, who were trying to love God and love others as they ought. Paul wanted to comfort them. He was writing to a church that was heartbroken over a number of things. I believe today that many of us are heartbroken. We look at the we look at our own country, we look at the world, we see how many have died from this virus. We see others who have lost loved ones, even in our church family recently. There are many who are having anniversaries, we could say, of loved ones going to be with the Lord soon this year. We need comfort, we need encouragement, and God knows that because as Paul says, he is the, the God of all comfort and the Father of mercy. So this morning, I would like to just 
briefly look at some of these verses once again, give some explanation, and then look at four reminders that we need to remind us, to encourage us of the Christian's abundant comfort in Christ. First of all, I think we should be reminded of this fact. God never minimizes or hides the reality of Christian suffering. Throughout the New Testament, God makes it very clear, and Jesus even spoke to his disciples that he would suffer and they would also suffer if they would follow him as he had called them to. Today is Palm Sunday, and this is the most unique Palm Sunday I think I've ever had, and the fact that I'm not gathering with God's church. And yet you remember Palm Sunday looks back to when Christ entered the city of Jerusalem humbly, meekly, and yet he was entering as a as a, a king might enter into the city. You remember the people were praising him and waving those palm branches, and they were casting their robes down before him on the ground so he could ride his donkey over them as a, as a symbolic gesture of honoring their king. And yet Jesus Christ, remember, was not entering Jerusalem at that time to be crowned king. He was entering to receive a different crown, a crown of thorns. He was entering to die, to suffer in our place on the cross. And in doing that, for us, he was setting an example for us how we were going to be called to live as well. We were going to be called to suffer for the glory of Christ. And it's interesting when we get to verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God, or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he refers to God the Father as not only the Father of Jesus Christ, God the Father, but also he is the Father of mercies, and he is the God of all comfort. He is the source of mercy for us. He is the source of comfort for his children. And he says in verse 4 that this God of all mercy and comfort is the one. He is the one who comforts us, verse 4, comforts us in all our affliction. God allows the affliction in our life so that he can comfort us like we would never have noticed his comfort before if we hadn't had the suffering. We need to remember that God never hides the fact that we or minimizes the fact, the reality of Christian suffering. We will suffer if we follow Christ. But secondly, we need to remember this. God never ceases. He never stops being the Christian source of mercy and comfort. Notice Paul says, who comforts us in all our affliction. You think of the life of the Apostle Paul. Remember what he was like before he became a Christian? Paul hated Christians before he himself became a Christian. A Christian. If you remember when we first meet Paul, his name is not Paul, it's Saul. And in Acts chapter 8, we see that he is breathing threats he is giving out threats and making good on threats to the church. He was traveling all around the region of Jerusalem, finding Christians and imprisoning them, and many times having them be killed because he hated the thought that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. He didn't believe Jesus was God. He didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. He didn't believe Jesus was the deliverer he needed for his sins. And he saw, even at his own hand, Many Christians suffer. And then God changed his heart, didn't he? God reached down into Paul's life, and as he interacted with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and we see how God's Spirit opens Paul's eyes to see Jesus finally for who Jesus is, Paul is changed. God changed his heart. God changes his view of God and Jesus. And Paul becomes, by faith in Jesus Christ, he becomes a Christian. And now Paul, right away, learned what it meant to suffer for Christ. As his former friends and allies who hated Christ now turned on him. You remember when God was speaking to Ananias, he said, Ananias, don't be afraid to go visit Paul. He's your brother in Christ now. 
and he's my chosen vessel. I'm going to send Paul out to the Gentiles, and I'm going to show Paul how much he will have to suffer for my name. Paul, who had caused Christian suffering, now was able and called by God to suffer for Christ. He knew he had seen God comfort Christians as he persecuted them. And now he saw in his own life how God continued to be the comforter, the one who gave him hope, the one who drew his heart and mind to the promises of God for him. And he saw God comfort him in all affliction. Aren't you thankful that God is there to comfort us in any affliction we face? Some afflictions, some trials, some uh, difficulty to go through are definitely harder than others. And yet God is there through all of them. He never ceases to be the Christian source of mercy and comfort. He's there with you right now if you are a Christian. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And you believe that God raised his son from the dead so that you also could have eternal life if you put your faith and trust in him. And God is with you. He's comforting you. And he wants his truth and his mercy to be the hope and the comfort that you need and you rest upon in times of great difficulty. He'll never stop being that for you. Third, I would say, a third thing we need to remember, even as we look at this passage, is that God never takes the suffering of his children lightly. He never takes it lightly. He never just... Oh yeah, my, my child's going to suffer today, but I don't care. No, God cares greatly. This is why Paul, or I'm sorry, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse, verse 7, cast all your care, 5, 8, cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. We see that God allowed Paul to suffer much in his ministry. God even called him to a ministry of suffering. See that Jesus Christ called us to take up our cross daily and follow him. Be willing to die daily for Christ, to follow him, to love him with our life, to be willing to endure whatever difficulty we may have in this life and know that in doing so, if we're living for Christ, that we're following in his steps and he will bless us for being faithful to obey what he's called us to do, even through suffering. But notice Paul says in verse 8, he says, We don't want you to be unaware, brothers of the affliction we experienced in Asia. He says, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you've, some of you have already been feeling that way this past week, where you are so totally burdened. It's as if this burden is on your back that you cannot lift off. And it's an emotional, physical, maybe it's a financial, a relational, but it is a burden that in trial that is so heavy on you that you think you may not make it through another day. Paul says here, we despaired of life itself. We thought that we were going to die. And in verse 9, indeed, we felt that we had already received the sentence of death. We were just waiting for it to happen. And yet Paul says, but God had a purpose. God had a good purpose for our suffering. And if you look at verse 9, he goes on to say, but that burden, that despair, that feeling of fear, that great difficulty that we faced was given to us by God to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Remember back to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember when they were commanded to bow down before that golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up? They said, no, we're not going to worship that image. We only worship God alone. And Nebuchadnezzar was ready to throw them into a burning, fiery furnace. It was so hot, this furnace, that it killed the guards who were holding Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response. They said, even if our God does not spare us, we're going to obey him. They had a faith in God that even if God allowed them to die, they believed that God would still take care of them. Throughout scripture, we see that God is the God of the living, not of the dead. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And the only reason we have hope in this life as Christians is because Christ 
rose from the dead. He defeated death. And by him defeating death, he defeats death in our own lives so that we can have his gift of eternal life. Paul goes to the resurrection power of God. Here in verse 9, he says, God allowed us to have the suffering. He does not take the suffering lightly. He had a purpose for our suffering. And that is so that we would depend even more upon our God who raises the dead. So even if God allowed Paul to die in this time of affliction in Asia, God wanted them to believe that, you know what, if that's what God has for us, then we're going to trust him because he will raise us from the dead even through that. And also, if you look in verse 10, he says, God delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. I believe here Paul's looking to that blessed hope, the return of Christ or the reality that we who die in Christ are raised to walk in newness of life, in eternal life with God in heaven. We thank God for the blessed hope that is ours, that one day Christ will return and take all of us to heaven. But also, as we read in 1 Thessalonians, that there is great comfort because those who die in this life go to be with the Lord. So there is comfort even as we lose loved ones in Christ knowing that they are with the Lord. And Paul here says, you, God, taught us. God taught us through this suffering that he is our comfort. He is the source of our mercy and comfort. And he doesn't minimize suffering. He doesn't take it lightly. He has a purpose for it in allowing it. And that was to cause us to depend upon him even more, to know his strength, to know his power even more. I want to encourage you, if you're going through a deep, dark time of struggle right now. If you're a Christian, God does not take the struggle lightly. I remember, and I've used, I've mentioned Caleb a couple times, and I hope he doesn't get too tired of me using him as an example, but I, when Caleb broke his leg, when he was, I believe, three years old, three or four years old, um, one of the hardest things that I had to do up to that point of being a dad was when we got to uh, the emergency room and Caleb had broken his leg and um, he was in pain, but he was a tough guy and his leg, he had, he had it bent at his knee because it kept pressure off his bone that was broken. And I remember the doctor coming to me and saying, uh, dad, we're going to have to get his leg to go straight so that we can properly bind it and help that bone to start healing as it ought to. And they said, we're going we, we, to be doing the wrapping of the leg, but we need you to gently press down on his leg and get it straight. And uh, I knew that was going to hurt. They told me it's going to hurt. But we, we're gonna, if, you, if you do that, we'll do it as quickly as we can. And pretty soon the pain will be gone. I remember little Caleb looking up at me and, you know, I could see in his eyes he'd been crying a lot from the pain, but they were, he wasn't crying now. And I remember, uh, I still remember to this day, having to look and say, buddy, this is going to hurt, but daddy loves you, and we need to do this to help your leg. And I, he didn't fight me, but I could see fear in his eyes. And um, I remember that I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to allow it, but I knew that he had to go through this time of pain so that his leg would heal properly. It would become strong, and it would become healed as it needed to be. So I remember pushing his little leg down and even he was trying to fight it because I knew it hurt. And I had to just push that leg down. And I remember seeing him put his head back and just cry. And then it was, it was over in a couple moments. I remember going and giving him a hug after they were done wrapping, saying, I love you, buddy. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I had to go through that pain. And yet his leg is healed. He's able to run. He's able to do different things. And, and I remember that God used that time in my life. It hurt. I didn't like it. And I did not take it lightly. If I could have done it any other way, I wish I could have taken that pain for him. I wish I, there could have been another way, but it needed to be done. I didn't take it lightly. And there was a purpose for it. That his leg would heal. I pray that when we realize that God, when God allows pain into our lives, he's not doing it because he doesn't love us. He loves us greatly. He loves us more than we know. And in his good, sovereign, gracious, merciful, loving plan for us, 
He has allowed us to be at this time in history going through this trial. And all of us have impacted various ways with not able to gather together. Others of us have had things outside of this COVID-19, the loss of loved ones, difficulty with other trials in our lives. Can I encourage you that God does not take the suffering of his children lightly, but fourth and lastly, that God never intends for his children's suffering to be pointless, aimless, or wasted. The doctors had come to me in that ER room and said, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to try it out, but we're not sure if it'll work. Or we just want you to, to, to cause this pain in your child's life for no reason. I would say, no, I'm not doing that. But they explained the reason. There was a very good reason. And a good point was so that his bones would be in proper alignment and they would heal. So I knew it needed to be done. God knows far greater what we need than we, don't we? We, we realize that. And when we realize that God has a good purpose for our suffering, part of that purpose is for us to know his comfort and to see his mercy in a way we haven't seen before, but also to strengthen us so that we will truly trust in him and that we will be more like Christ. And maybe even some of the things that we held on to closely that maybe we shouldn't, and he allows that to be taken away. We learn that God is all we need. He's more than we need. You know, there's some passages of Scripture, if you look at them, they don't seem to make a lot of sense unless you realize that God is the God of all comfort and mercy and he loves us. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Count to all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God does not want us to lack in any spiritual strengthening or edification that we need in our life. So he allows the suffering. He allows that. And, and James says, count it joy. Be thankful and actually have joy when you suffer for Christ. Because God's whittling away the aspects of your life that we shouldn't be dependent upon. And he's causing us to be strong, to be strengthened, to be steadfast lacking nothing. Romans chapter 5, Paul writes in verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, verse 3, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God never minimizes or hides the reality of Christian suffering. God never ceases to be, though, the Christian source of mercy and comfort during that suffering. And God never takes lightly the suffering of his children. And God never intends for our suffering as Christians to be aimless, pointless, or wasted. So God encourage us to, to think of these three thoughts as we could apply this truth to our lives, and then we'll close. One, I believe through suffering, God is calling us to have an upward focus, an upward focus to look to him, to ask the right questions. I think one of the hardest things when Christians suffer is for us to ask the right questions. I know it is for me. So many times when I enter in a time of difficulty or trial or, or affliction, I want to ask, why? Why is God allowing this? And it's not a wrong question in and of itself to, to wonder why. Why is God allowing this COVID-19 virus to, to affect his church in this way, to affect people's lives this way? Why is God not allowing us to already have a, 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 a cure for this disease, this virus? It's not wrong to ask, to wonder. But if that's the only questions we ask, we're going to get very discouraged because God doesn't have to answer that. Many times God doesn't answer when we want. We actually need to ask who. Start the question the right way. Instead of why, who? 
who is in control of the situation? Who is in control of this universe? Who has saved me and redeemed me and shown me his everlasting love? Who is my source of comfort and mercy during times like this? And then maybe ask, what? What does God want to teach me through this time? What does God want to show me about who he is during this difficulty? We pray for our medical physicians, our nurses, our doctors who are going through this. And I can't imagine the fear that can be going through many of their hearts, the anxiety of, you know, going and helping take care of people who have this sickness or being in an environment where there is a sickness such as this spreading and wondering, will I catch this or not? And we thank God for them as they're on the front lines. We pray for them. I would encourage those who have fears of such a kind like that to, to, to say, but God, how are you going to show yourself strong in my life today? How are you going to empower me and strengthen me so that my anxiety doesn't rise to the level where I'm letting that control me rather than you guide me and you comfort me and show me your mercy? I believe God wants us to have an upward focus, but also I would say, secondly, God wants us to have an inward focus. God, what do you want to do in my life through this? How do you want to change my heart? What in my heart needs to change so that I will trust you and, and really live for your glory and respond? And, and as dads and moms lead their families to, to, to say, children's going to be okay because God's going to bless us. We don't have all the answers, but we know we can trust God. So we don't have to panic. We don't have to live in fear. It's not wrong to be afraid. I want to be careful on that. It's not wrong to be afraid. But we take those fears that God allows to rise up in our hearts and we take them to the Lord and say, God, help me as I'm afraid. Help me trust you so that I don't make wrong decisions. So I don't think wrong thoughts about you or about others. So God wants us to have an upward focus, an inward focus. But notice what Paul said here, an outward focus. We'll read this and we'll close. Back at verse 4, God is the one who comforts us in all our affliction. But why does he give us amazing comfort? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the same comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Paul goes on and he tells this church, look, when you're comforted by God, don't take that comfort and just keep it to yourselves. Share it. I said on that, on that fourth thought that God never intends for his children's suffering to be wasted. I encourage you, don't waste your suffering. John Piper wrote a book by that title, Don't Waste Your Suffering. And in that book, he encourages us, even from situations in his own life where he's had to suffer, to not waste this opportunity to glorify God through suffering, but rather to use it in a way where we encourage others and we glorify God and we share with them what God's teaching us. We don't just want to be inward. We need to be upward, inward look in our own hearts, and then outward. And through that, I think we truly will love God and love others as he's called us to. So as we close this morning, I would just say this. The Christian is never alone or without help in seasons of suffering. That's our big idea for today. I hope an encouragement to you. The Christian, if you're a Christian, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are never alone or without help during seasons of suffering. We're all going through suffering on different levels right now. But as we go through it, may we know that God is with us, that he's here to encourage us, that he has given us an abundant comfort in Christ. And may we take the comfort that he gives us as we pray to him, as we pray to one another, as we pray through that church directory that I hope you got in the mail this week, that we encourage others with the comfort that God has given us. What an amazing work God will do in our church family as we share for one, with one another, we pray with one another, we encourage one another with the comfort that we have. I encourage you, the, the mail is still going. The mail is still going out. So take a letter, write it. Write a note of encouragement to one of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Send a text, pick up the phone and make a call. Thankfully, we can't get the virus through phone calls. So I pray that you will, you will look for ways to comfort one another with a comfort that God gives you. I love you. Stay strong. Don't be discouraged. Rest in the wonderful promise of God, who is the God of all mercy and the God of all comforts. Lord willing, we'll be together again soon, worshiping, praising, 
thanking God for the lessons he taught us through this season of affliction as a result of this worldwide virus. God bless. Hope you have a wonderful week. I'm praying for you, and we'll keep in touch.